sin. He would fulfill the pictures that were out there. The remembrances of these lambs, multitudes of them slain from before the foundation, or he was slain from before the foundation of the world. He fulfilled the types. He also fulfilled the type of offering as he offered himself without spot to God. And ultimately, as he was hanging on a cross, he bore the curse of the law, for cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus fulfilled the law in every detail. <clears throat> it says he didn't come to abolish in the NIV or to destroy in the King James. It means to dissolve or to make empty. He didn't come to set it aside. He didn't come to disavow it. He didn't come to, to render it useless. He came rather to fulfill it, to accomplish the very essence of the law itself. He not only lived perfect within the law, but he is the answer to the law. He is the one who would come and fulfill it in every detail. Even the insignificant details of the law, Jesus said, they're going to be fulfilled. Everything will be accomplished or fulfilled. Well, interesting as we understand that Jesus, while he was coming to start something uh, new, at least it appeared new, it was never new in God's plan. <clears throat> the law is a watershed. The law was referred to, referring to the uh, books of Moses and also the books of the prophets Jesus referred to. It's a watershed. If we have those who diminish the law will be diminished. Those who practice and teach it will be enlarged. And we're reminded that if you're going to be real in the law, you have to rise to a different standard than the Pharisees and teachers. You see, they had their own sense of righteousness, but it was a sense of righteousness that was superimposed on top of the law. They viewed the law through a particular colored um, screen, through a particular colored mask, and if, he, if you didn't keep the law the way they thought you needed to keep the law, then you were guilty. Jesus says regarding them, he said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You're hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. It was interesting as we... <clears throat> were touring Israel many years ago, you come across these beautiful tombs that are set up. Absalom built his own tomb. Uh, David is in a tomb and so on. You have all these tombs. And Jesus uses these as a picture, as a word picture. Outside you look beautiful. But just go inside and it's full of decay. Dead men's bones. All that's left. You may look good on the outside, but on the inside, there's a problem. Sometimes we, as Christians, function more caring about the outside than we do the inside. I'm reminded of the words <clears throat> of Scripture, out of the heart the mouth speaks. You see, what comes out is what's already in. And we are what we think. And so Jesus is reminding the Pharisees they are condemned because they are hypocrites. They're pretending to be something that they're not. <clears throat> we come to the next section, and I'm going to challenge you to take your Bible out and read along with me. Um, <clears throat> This is a section that I've entitled, You Have Heard It Said. And when Jesus says, you've heard it said, he, he is referring to the law. He's going back and grabbing pieces of the law and bringing it forward and saying, you have heard it said in the law, but I now say to you. And so this whole section is about that. The first one is <clears throat> verse 21. You've heard it said the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. 
But I tell you, notice that difference. You have heard it said, don't murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way, or he may be hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may well be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth. You will not get out until you've paid the last penny. And so the first uh, comment that he makes is, you shall not murder. And of course, we all say, well, I haven't murdered. But Jesus brings it to a higher standard. It's not just the act, even the thought or the emotion, even the, the anger uh, is considered in Jesus' measure, murder. You have committed murder in your heart. <clears throat> Interesting, as Jesus goes through the, all of these situations we're going to look at today, he takes us beyond the outward and takes us back inside. He takes us beyond the actions and takes us back to the thoughts. He says, for example, if you say to somebody at Raqqa, uh, basically you're saying you're just worthless, you're, you're useless, you're nothing. Or you say to somebody, you're a fool. He says, you're in danger. Both of these things are devaluing God's creation. We have been created in his image. How can you say of somebody, you're useless, you're worthless? How can you say of somebody, you're a fool? In Jesus' mind, in the real reality of the law, these devalue the human creation who are created in God's image. And we ask the question, do personal grudges matter? When I have something against somebody, does it matter? Yes, it does. For that grudge takes over my personality. That grudge is, becomes the fodder in which my mind thinks. And everything is geared around that grudge. The person you have the grudge against may not even know it. But we notice that in Jesus' description here, our unsettled grievances affect my worship. And so if I have a grievance against somebody, or somebody has a grievance against me and I know about it, I need to go and settle it. Set my offering to one side. Go and settle it, and then come and offer my worship. <clears throat> Peter talks about the same thing in regarding to our marriages, which are treat our spouses with respect and honor is a weaker vessel that we might, our prayers might not be hindered. In other words, the way we treat others affects my relationship with him. Remember Jesus was saying in Luke chapter 6, uh, you who are trying to solve the problem in somebody else's life, why don't you consider the plank in your own eye before you try and take the speck of sawdust out of his eye? Consider what you've got in your own life before you try and fix somebody else. You've heard it said, do not murder, but I'm telling you, even the thought is murder. Next he comes to adultery in uh, chapter, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. <clears throat> wow. In relation to our culture today, this runs, certainly runs counterproductive. 
But it's interesting that as Jesus takes the words of the law, and the words of the law are these, that if you're going to divorce your wife, you must give her a letter of divorce. In other words, you give her the, the framework in which she can go and remarry. And Jesus said, but you're already causing a problem. You're forcing her to commit adultery because it's assumed that we will pursue these interpersonal relationships. It is natural and normal. It's natural and normal for um, <clears throat> us to look at each other, to evaluate each other. But Jesus said, if you look with lust, then you've already committed adultery in your heart. And so this addresses a whole problem that we have in our culture today. I was intrigued that uh, <clears throat> Mike Lindell is coming out with a new um, counter to Twitter. And it's going to be called Frank. It was supposed to be open to today, but apparently it's not going to open till tomorrow. But what intrigued me was this. He's not going to allow any words of profanity. So you're not allowed to say anything. Uh, you can't use God's name in vain. Number two, you can't use some of the dirty words that you find on some of these places. Uh, no pornography words. And so he is addressing, because he is a born-again Christian, he, he has been rescued from a life of sin, and he makes no bones about it. He's living for God. You'll know him if you watch any kind of television at all, especially Fox News, as the My Pillow Man. But it was interesting to me that he puts limits, not on the content of what's being said, but on the wording and the, on the, you can't take the Lord's name in vain. Good for you, Mike. <clears throat> We're reminded that the mind is a source of this problem. Ed Billingham used to say, thoughts are tracks for actions to run on. And isn't that true? The scripture puts it this way, as a man thinketh, so is he. Think about David. He looked. Oh, but then he went beyond look. He lusted. A lust is a strong desire, a desire to have Bathsheba. And so he not only looked and saw beauty, and then he lusted, he wanted her, and then he acted, he sent and brought her to him, and he committed uh, adultery with her. He caused her to break her marriage uh, vows as well. How to deal with a very real problem? Jesus said it's so severe. Deal with it catastrophically. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Because he said the values of eternity are worth more than the lustful desires of the moment. And so <clears throat> we must uh, <clears throat> deal with these things. You can't divorce, dissolve your marriage with just the correct procedure. Giving a certificate of divorce, Deuteronomy chapter 24. The thrust is not the certificate, but the prohibition. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 to 4, you'll see that the reason for the um, <clears throat> discussion there on divorce is that if, if the husband puts away his wife because he doesn't like her for whatever reason, he gives her a bill of divorce. And then she goes and marries somebody else, and he, gives, he puts her away, and he also uh, sets her to one side because he doesn't like her. The real thrust of Deuteronomy 24 is husband one cannot now remarry his previous wife. That's the thrust. But that's not what the Pharisees and, and teachers were uh, going on. They were going on the certificate. Paperwork does not remove consequences. I see it all around us today. We were in a park uh, Friday night for a, a pizza picnic. And while we were sitting on top of the hill at, um, uh, the, in the park, there was a couple next to us, and she had brought a nice little vase and put a daffodil in the vase, and they were having a little party together. They had their, um, <clears throat> their wine glasses out, and they were celebrating something and so we got talking and here it was their 30 something anniversary i said oh we got you beat um, <clears throat> it's wonderful to see marriages that last and and persevere 
as husbands and wives put up with each other and, and build a relationship and inspire each other and uh, do things to build rather than tear down. But our culture is not, that's not the norm. Our culture is filled with people who have decided the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And the consequences are not pretty. The consequences are severe. Severe even in the, in the people themselves, severe in their children. Um, <clears throat> Jesus is saying, no, it's not the act of divorce. It's even the look, even the lustful look. So then we come to the next section um, <clears throat> regarding our oaths. Again, you have heard it, that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you've made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all. Do not take oaths, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is a city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Wow. <clears throat> it seems like whenever we enter into a contract, be it a real estate contract or buying a car, there's reams and reams of paper and you sign multiple times and uh, <clears throat> I've got a picture coming up on the next slide of uh, a federal judge in the U.S. being sworn in with his hand on his Bible, and I'm thrilled to see that it seems to be his own Bible, not just a Bible off the shelf. You've heard it said, don't break your oath, but I say to you, don't swear by anything. As kids, we used to say, Scout's Honor. Uh, <clears throat> I'll do this, so help me God. I'll do this, or I'll give you my bag of marbles. We're swearing by various things. I want to ask you a question. Does swearing on a Bible make your words any more viable? Jesus says anything beyond a simple yes or no, a simple commitment to do something, is from the evil one. And so, as we put our hands on a Bible and say, so help me God, I'll do this or I'll do that, does that make it any different? No. Your vows, your oaths depend on the real you, the level of commitment you have. The psalmist writes and he says, who shall enter the hill of the Most High? Who shall enter into God's tabernacle? And one of the conditions is this, he that swears to his own hurt. In other words, you make a promise, you keep it whether it hurts or not. Do your promises carry weight? Do our commitments to each other, do they stand no matter what? Do we have to have some form of swearing uh, an oath to make our words valuable? No! Our words should be our words. Our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Do not swear by anything. I believe this is a picture of Mr. Gorsuch as he's being sworn into the Supreme Court in the U.S. And you can see his hand is on a Bible. I, I'm impressed to see that it is a worn Bible. I suggest it's probably his own Bible. And this is the way uh, things are done in the U.S. If you're being sworn into any political office, they stand before somebody and you repeat your vows and it's Put your hand on the Bible. Well, Jesus says you don't have to do that. It doesn't change anything. And then in this same passage, he spoke about an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Retribution by law. In some cultures, this spirals without end. I remember hearing of a culture 
in Latin America where somebody killed a member of a family and so a member of that family had to go back and kill a member of the killer's family and then vice versa. It just keeps on happening until both families are totally wiped out. <clears throat> the law said, if you do something and you injure your neighbor in some way, you must be injured the same way. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 20. A fracture for a fracture. If somehow I broke your arm, then you must break my arm. If somehow I caused you blindness, then you must cause me blindness. If somehow I knocked out your front tooth, then you must knock out my front tooth. <clears throat> the one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. This is repeated three times in the Old Testament. Jesus teaches a more excellent way. Don't resist, submit. Oh, that goes against every rule of humanity. Turn the other cheek. <clears throat> I was, uh, we were at a wedding recently, and I saw an individual cheekily reach up and swipe her husband across the cheek. <clears throat> but I noticed he didn't turn his other cheek for a hit on the other side. Jesus says, if somebody hits you on the right side, turn to him your left. Don't resist. Go the extra mile. If somebody asks you to go with them one mile, go with them two. Be generous. Give to those who ask you. That's Jesus' view of retribution. Set aside the retribution. It's not the way to go. There's a higher way. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, we read these words. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. The words are really, um, to put it into <clears throat> modern English, when they hurled their threats at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he committed himself to him who judges justly. When he was being falsely accused on the cross, he didn't utter any threats. Listen to his words. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yes, Jesus practiced what he preached. <clears throat> Last of all, uh, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. <clears throat> Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are, you not, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. <clears throat> Leviticus, we were instructed to love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting that <clears throat> it's easy to love those who love us. Sometimes if we've got an obnoxious neighbor, it's not easy to love them. But Jesus said, no, I want you to be like your heavenly father. I want you to love your enemies. I want you not only to express your kindness to those who express their kindness back to you, but rather reach out to others and those who are opposing you, show them kindness. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Can you imagine the many Christians who are being persecuted around the world and they are praying for those who are persecuting them? Think of the many Christians in the early days of Nero as he was pursuing them and they were praying for Nero. Think of this. God blesses both the evil and the good the same. This beautiful sunny weather that we're experiencing is a blessing, would you not agree? But it's a blessing to those who are not following God's law. It's a blessing to those who are. It's a blessing to those who are criminal crime elements. It's a blessing to those who are living righteously. God blesses one and all with the sun and the rain. Jesus said, the world loves its friends. Yeah, they do. But we are to love our enemies as well as our friends. 
He says, be perfect. The idea of perfect is not the idea of absolute perfection as Jesus was. Jesus was holy. We sang, we want to see you high and lifted up. Holy, holy, holy. Remember this, where those three words come from. Isaiah is caught into the presence of God and he sees in the presence of God these angelic beings crying holy, holy, holy. And he's reminded of his sinfulness. He is a prophet of God and he is consumed with his wickedness, with his sinfulness as he considers the holiness of God. This being perfect is not that perfect. It's the idea of being fully developed, being fully mature, being well-rounded, the same as our Heavenly Father is perfect, is complete. <clears throat> as we come to the end of our study today, there's some takeaways. We see contrasting messages. The message of the law, you've heard it said, Jesus' words, but I say, as he takes us to another standard. My question is, do we stand on our own rights or take the Jesus road? What would Jesus do was a phrase that was <clears throat> around before. Would we stand on our rights or would we take the Jesus road? Would we say, my rights are being violated, but indeed I will turn the other cheek, I will give myself, I will pray for those who persecute me. The question is, do I want to win the battle or the war? Sometimes you have to give up on something because we know that the battle is already won in heaven. We want to win the war. We want to be on the winning side. We want to be lined up with Jesus. Do I want man's approval or God's approval? Do I want to be approved by the Pharisees and keep every little detail of their, in, of their insignificant <coughs> laws? Or do I want the approval of God? We will all be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is going to sit on the judgment seat and he's going to judge each and every one of us. There won't be a frown on his face. There will be a smile because we are the redeemed that are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We have been redeemed. But I would like to have his approval. I would like to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. What part of my life needs adjusting to Jesus' standard? <clears throat> it will probably be something to do with the way I think. Because as I think, then my actions come out. What part of my life needs to be adjusted? You decide. And if there's anyone here this morning and you have not received Jesus as your Savior, if, if he doesn't stand absolutely in the place of you when it comes to God's eternity. If he hasn't taken your place at the cross, you need to receive him, accept him as your own personal savior. You need to say, Jesus, I know I am sinful and you are absolutely sinless. I know you died on the cross for sinners and I'm a sinner, so therefore you died for me and I want you to save me. I want to be rescued from my life of sin. I want to be your child. I want to live with you forever. Will you save me? And he will indeed take you at your word. As we <clears throat> close this uh, service today, uh, we're going to pray, and then following that, we're going to have a song, and it's a song of surrender. I surrender all. We have a choice. Will I surrender my life to be what he wants me to be, or will I continue to stand on my rights and do what I want to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you for this passage of Scripture as Jesus bears his soul, comparing the Old Testament with what the real meaning is. We thank you for his perfections. We thank you that he didn't set a, set a, a, a standard that he didn't keep himself. He absolutely walked this walk. He walked his talk. We thank you that when he asked us to turn the other cheek, he did that. When he asked us to go the second mile, he did that. We thank you for the blessings that we have as we read these scriptures, as we're challenged regarding our lustful lives, as we're challenged regarding 
our anger, as we're challenged regarding every part of our life. We thank you that your way is best. And we commit our way to you today. Be with each one who's hurting, with those who are suffering. We thank you that you walk with us, and sometimes you carry us. We just thank you in Jesus' precious name. We would like to uh, surrender our lives once again uh, to your will in, our, um, in your great kingdom. Be with us, we pray, as we sing this song. In Jesus' name, amen. I surrender all. Give myself.